Hello, welcome to the channel Why Stories. Enjoy watching. You're already old. It's embarrassing to go out with you, said her husband, and he left for a younger woman. When he brought his mistress into public, he was so humiliated that he had to run away. The morning rays of the sun tickled her snow-white skin, pulling the wonderful woman from her slumber. Her golden hair sprawled across the white pillow, and her cold gray eyes opened wide, gazing at the ceiling. Another new day, promising nothing good. Tessa Schweitzer, the most beautiful woman of the elite, was the wife of the well-known oligarch Ilian Schweitzer. Their surname was on the lips of everyone living in this city, in this country. There was not a single resident who did not know the Schweitzers themselves. The business officially registered in the legal sector was, in reality, illegal. But who cares about such details? People admired the wealth, extravagance, and luxury, and no one thought to ask, how did they earn it? Maybe they stole from someone? Maybe they deceived someone? No, such questions were not asked. They simply looked at the status and gasped at the sight of expensive cars and heads held high. Meanwhile, the oligarchs and their wives paid no attention to those beneath them in status. Tessa hadn't been like this when she fell into Ilian's web. Even in her youth, he was someone to be feared and, at the same time, respected. She was an ordinary medical student who enjoyed reading and painting. Coming from a poor family with scarce hobbies, that very Ilian, known back then as the Swede, brought color to her mundane life. Strolls through the city, cafes that Tessa could never afford, imported cosmetics, and clothes that were a luxury at the time. But two years later, she became the wife of a gangster and, in the future, one of the most famous oligarchs in the city. Everything turned out to be far less rosy than it could have been. Ten years after their wedding, Ilian's perfect mask fell away, revealing the man he had so carefully hidden beneath tenderness, affection, and courtship. He became a hard, calculating bastard who used Tessa merely as a trophy wife, a wife viewed as a symbol of her husband's status. But the woman was no fool either. Picking up her husband's worst traits, she became someone she despised. A calculating gaze, elegance befitting society, cold touches, and emptiness in her eyes. With her head held high, she moved forward beside Ilian. At every banquet, charity evening, and celebration, all the men's attention was solely fixed on the Schweitzer, and she knew it. She fed on this, relishing it. Tessa, breakfast is ready, came Diana's voice from behind the wooden door. Ilian is already waiting for you. I'm coming, Tessa replied in a cold tone, rising from the bed. Icy water splashed her snow-white skin, and the woman involuntarily grimaced. After applying a mask to her face, Tessa brushed her teeth, threw on a sheer robe over her nightgown, and left the room. Her feet stepped on the cold floor, making Tessa roll her eyes. She always asked the maids to turn on the underfloor heating when she woke up, but they constantly forgot. Descending to the first floor, she approached the man who paid her no attention. His dark chestnut hair, with strands of gray, was slicked back, and his suit was so impeccably pressed that it almost made the woman feel nauseous from the farce. Good morning, darling, Tessa whispered, kissing her husband on the cheek. How are you? Don't annoy me, Ilian snorted, sipping water from a glass that cost more than someone's wardrobe. You've been irritating me lately. The blonde merely smirked and took her designated seat. The table was overflowing with delicacies, but the woman didn't even touch them. She only drank her coffee and waited for her beloved husband to leave the house. Mutual hatred gnawed at them both from the inside, but Tessa had to be who society expected her to be. A polite, statuesque, beautiful, elegant wife who cared for her husband. But Ilian didn't owe her anything. He kept his wife by his side only for status, and he wanted nothing else from her. He hadn't touched the woman he once idolized for years. They had no children, which Tessa was probably just as glad about as Ilian was. Nothing bound them to each other, but the woman had become so accustomed to her luxurious life that she wasn't ready to lose everything in the blink of an eye. While the man didn't want to lose the respect of colleagues and friends who all coveted the same ideal partner as Tessa, Ilian left the house without even sparing his wife a glance. 
He simply stood up in silence and walked out while making a phone call. As soon as the front door closed, Tessa sighed and headed to her bedroom. Hi, Martha, she said, waiting for a response on the phone. How are you? Can we meet? A gentle voice came through the line. She had no desire to sit within four walls, so visiting her close friend was not such a bad idea. Black classic pants, a white top, and matching sandals that perfectly complemented her outfit. Style was one of the qualities of a woman that attracted male attention, so Tessa always looked elegant, no matter where she was or who she was with. Upon leaving the house, she immediately noticed that there were very few cars on the road, nothing like before. Frowning, the woman headed toward her trusted confidant. Andres, where is everyone? Tessa asked, looking around the yard. Why did Ilian need all the cars? He drove them away, the 30-year-old man reported nervously, lowering his head. Where are we going? To Martha's, the blonde replied, settling into the back seat of the new Mercedes. You'll still tell me where the cars went. Andres cast a frightened glance at his boss's reflection in the rearview mirror and started the engine. He was the only one among Schweitzer's subordinates who saw his wife not as a trophy but as a living person. They often chatted during free moments and even discussed gossip within the elite. Tessa truly regarded him as a friend, which worked to her advantage. Andres frequently helped her gather information that she deemed important. The entire drive, Tessa remained silent, sensing that Andres was hiding something from her, but she decided not to press him with questions, waiting for him to confess on his own. They arrived at a house not far from the Schweitzers, in the same elite suburban neighborhood. After getting out of the car, the woman told the driver to pick her up in four hours and sent the man on his way. My dear, exclaimed a woman of the same age as Tessa, were you really able to escape your beloved husband's clutches and visit your friend? Martha Varis was just another trophy wife, but had far less authority than Tessa. She was beautiful and didn't look her age, but lacked charisma and presence. The woman truly loved her husband, which in this world was equivalent to a voluntary death sentence. One had to stop in their feelings in time to avoid suffering later. As you can see, I managed to escape, Tessa said, kissing her friend on the cheek. Let's go have a bottle of Chardonnay from your famous cellar. The women entered the house, chatting about the latest news in the elite circle. Sitting down at a glass table, beneath which lay collectible stamps, Martha opened the white wine and poured it into glasses. So, you really forgave Gustavo? Tessa asked, raising her glass from the table. Andre said he lost stocks while he was in Spain with the latest floozy. Martha's eyes darted around, clearly not expecting such information to surface in society. Martha, you know, Tessa began, everyone knows everything. Each person thinks their opinion matters, which is why information spreads in elite circles. I didn't think you would go to Spain with her, the woman said, her hair gleaming with chestnut black reflections in the sunlight. He promised not to give such big gifts to his. Say it outright, Martha. Tessa. Martha exclaimed, jumping up from her seat. You'd be better off talking about your husband's mistresses. Martha's face immediately changed, realizing she had let something slip. The entire elite knew that Ilian did not betray his queen, and no one ever raised the topic of his escapades. For the Schweitzer family, it was something like a taboo. What are you talking about? Tessa asked in surprise, downing her glass of wine. You know Ilian is faithful. You're the one who's so sure of that. Martha blurted out, unwilling to keep secrets from her friend. Gustavo asked me not to tell you, but I can't. You're not like me. You won't tolerate what Schweitzer has been doing behind your back for over two weeks now. Yes, Tessa knew that love and passion had long been absent between her and her husband, but she was so confident that Ilian would not betray his wife that she paid no attention to his late-night departures. Memories started to swirl in her head of when Schweitzer returned home late at night, drunk, yet so radiant that Tessa thought he was just playing poker for big money again. But apparently, that was not what the woman had hoped for. Speak, Martha, the blonde hissed through clenched teeth, grabbing the bottle of wine from the table. She was burning with anger. 
Speak, or I'll make you. You know whose wife I am. Vera immediately became anxious and mimicking her friend, downed her glass in one gulp. She grimaced at such a large amount of alcohol, then straightened up and took a deep breath. Only I and Gustavo know about this, maybe alien security, Martha began. Do you remember the trial your husband had to handle by himself? He said that the client wanted him as a lawyer, not his subordinates. Tessa nodded, recalling her husband's trip to Riga, where an old acquaintance lived. Gustavo went with him just because he wanted to, Martha continued, constantly rubbing her hands together. The woman was nervous. They came back from there with the three of them, Gustavo, Ilian, and Marilyn. The same defendant, the daughter of the person who asked Ilian to be the lawyer. He put her up in an expensive hotel, paying for it and giving her his black card. A black one, Tessa. Even wives get gold ones, and he gave her a black one. What are you talking about? Tessa jumped up from her seat, not fully comprehending what her friend had just said. This goes against the elite, Martha. Every oligarch in the elite society had unlimited cards, otherwise known as black cards. Money from illegal businesses flowed into these cards through the bank of a prominent businessman. Children, wives, and close associates used either gold or silver cards, which had limits set by the head of the family, a rule that had been in place since the inception of the elite. Tessa couldn't understand why her husband had decided to give a card to an unknown girl he brought back from Latvia. I'm not lying, Tess, Martha began again, already opening a second bottle of wine. He bought her a house, just not in our neighborhood, but in the one owned by the Litano Construction Company. Do you understand? It's as if he's hiding her. She's been in our city for two weeks, and he's hovering over her like a treasure. I don't know what connects them, but he's being overly protective of her. And since he forbade everyone from telling you, he's clearly sleeping with her. Everyone knows you won't allow yourself to be humiliated, even if you are just a trophy doll. Everyone in the elite is aware of your character. Ilian is deliberately hiding her. I don't know why, but don't judge me, Tessa, when you're in the same mess. Martha sat down next to the stunned Tessa and gently stroked her back. She didn't know how to offer support, so she simply remained silent, giving her friend a chance to digest the information. Tessa stared at the floor with her gray eyes, hardly moving. No. This was not jealousy. Her authority among the elite was undermined, and she was very angry at Ilian. Anger and fury. I'll make him regret this act, Tessa hissed, immediately pulling her phone from her pants pocket. Andres, get me a car. We're going to Ilian's office. After a curt goodbye to Martha, Tessa got into the car, and Andres immediately drove off. Are there cars at Marilyn's house? The woman asked, causing the driver to suddenly break. He was shocked at how his boss's wife could know such information. Don't be silent, Andres. There was no choice. The guy nodded briefly and continued driving. He would definitely get in trouble for driving the boss's wife to the office, but he couldn't dispute Tessa's order. It wasn't in his nature. I'll rip her guts out if I ever meet her, the blonde lamented, looking at the houses flying by outside. Andres, you traitor. You could have told me. I couldn't, Tessa, Andres replied, guilt-ridden. The boss's orders. I couldn't. Tessa nodded in understanding and rubbed her brow. When they arrived at the 20-story office, the woman took a deep breath. There was no choice but to pour all her anger onto the husband who had brazenly deceived her for two weeks. Clacking her heels, she entered the building, and the young receptionist immediately jumped up from her seat. Tessa, good afternoon, she said, but Tessa didn't even spare her a glance. With her chin held high, she moved toward Ilian's office. The secretary also jumped up at the sight of the boss's wife. He kept talking about some meeting and that Schweitzer wasn't in place, but Tessa remained silent, striding swiftly into the office. Good afternoon, businessmen, Tessa sneered, throwing her small handbag directly onto the glossy surface of the expensive desk and sitting down across from her husband. For men sat around him, staring in shock and lust at the audacious woman who had barged into the boss's office without knocking. 
Tessa, what are you doing? Ilian hissed through clenched teeth, trying to contain his fury. He couldn't stand it when women interfered in his work or disobeyed his orders. Get out, I have a meeting. Schweitzer merely smirked and sprawled across the chair as if it were her office. I have a serious conversation for you, my dear husband, the woman said, watched by five pairs of eyes. She loved attention. She enjoyed it. And your meeting doesn't concern me at all when it comes to the girl you're hiding from me. Ilian's eyes widened in surprise. He hadn't expected this turn of events and didn't want his wife to know about Marilyn's existence. But his plans had crumbled. Watch your tongue, Schweitzer exclaimed, his jaw twitching. He was very displeased. Dear colleagues, please leave us for ten minutes. We'll continue the meeting later. The men nodded and began gathering their folders from the table, exchanging meaningful glances at one another. In a few minutes, only Tessa and Ilian remained in the office. What are you doing? Ilian shouted, rising from his seat. Who do you think you are to barge in here like this? I'm your wife, you damn womanizer, Tessa replied, not breaking her gaze from her husband. She was angry. Very angry. And if you hope to keep the Latvian a secret from me, I have bad news for you. Ilian's eyes flashed with fire as he lunged at his wife, grabbing her by the hair. You're just a base bitch who became a queen only because of me, Ilian said directly into Tessa's lips. You're nothing without me, act appropriately. You've aged, it's already embarrassing to go out with you. Is that so? Tessa laughed, and Ilian loosened his grip. Your friends don't think so. They undress me with their eyes at the first opportunity, and they respect you not only for your business and money, but also for having someone like me by your side. Proud and free. Free? Now the office was filled with Schweitzer's laughter. If I leave you to fend for yourself, you wouldn't even survive. You've been my captive for over 20 years. Divorce me. And I'll show you why I still consider myself free, the woman declared, yanking her husband's hand away sharply. You'll become just another oligarch the moment you lose me. But people won't stop respecting me without you. Keep that in mind, you bastard. I'll file for divorce today, ungrateful woman, Ilian concluded, pointing at the door. Wait until you're left with nothing, you've driven me to this. The woman smirked and, grabbing a wooden king figurine from the table, threw it at the glass that separated the secretary's office from the bosses. A loud crash echoed as the shards flew in different directions. The secretary stared in shock through the hole that now adorned the space where the glass used to be, trembling. Don't underestimate me, Schweitzer. You said it right. I've been with you for 20 years, and I know what I'm doing, Tessa spat. Leaving the office and leaving her husband with only the lingering scent of her perfume and her confidence. Screams erupted behind the woman, but she walked proudly toward the exit. Andres was waiting for her in the foyer and immediately rushed to Tessa, who didn't even notice him. You did something, didn't you? Andres whispered. The security ran upstairs. I showed him not to provoke me, Tessa replied, smiling. We're getting a divorce. I'm too old for him. Andres looked at his boss in shock but couldn't say anything. It wasn't his place. He'll be looking for who leaked the information about Marilyn to you, Andres stated as they drove home. Who told you? The main thing is that it wasn't you, Tessa said, scrolling through her contacts for the right number. He would kill you for that, but Gustavo won't allow it with her. Martha? Andres asked. Not surprising. Once back home, Tessa grabbed a bottle of wine from the kitchen and locked herself in her room. She knew she couldn't win a court case against Ilian on her own. Ilian was one of the most influential lawyers with his own legal firm, so after the divorce, Tessa would have nothing left but the underwear bought with her husband's money. She needed the help of a more influential lawyer, and fortunately, she had one in mind. More than just an acquaintance, Grabbing the phone from the nightstand, she began scrolling through her contacts, fearing she might have deleted the number she needed. Come on, Nicholas, you called me, Tessa lamented, occasionally drinking wine straight from the bottle. I really need you right now. 
A smile finally appeared on her face when the screen displayed Nicholas Doros. Pressing the call button, she nervously held the phone to her ear and waited, recalling the long ago meeting with the one who had loved her. His hand rested on the waist of the young girl who still felt shy about herself and her body. The dress revealed her back and legs, making Tessa constantly shiver. She felt uncomfortable with how many pairs of eyes were staring at her and how proudly her husband presented her to his friends, as if she were a piece of art on display. You're beautiful, Tessa, the man said, looking straight into her eyes. He was close, but unlike the others, he didn't gawk at her. He steadied her eyes, trying to keep the conversation going. Thank you, Tessa replied reluctantly with a smile. I've lost Ilian. I think I'll go. I want to give you some advice, Tessa, the man continued, removing his hand from the blonde's waist. The girl turned to face him. You're smart, cunning, and you drive men crazy with your grace and beauty. Use it, or you won't survive in the elite. Tessa raised an eyebrow in question, not understanding what this stranger was talking about. Don't be the one who submits, be the one who dominates. Don't fall for Schweitzer's love, he's not capable of it by nature. He's being so polite to you now so that you'll become dependent on him. He wants you to become his and fall in love with him to the point of madness. In the elite, falling in love is signing your death warrant. I'll tell you something else, don't let him cheat, it will humiliate you. People around you are devouring you with their eyes, you're too fabulous for someone like Ilian. Be yourself and don't let him break you. Just remember everything I've told you. You're too innocent for the elite. Am I innocent now, as I was then? Tessa asked herself as a noise came through the phone. Nicholas, the woman asked, pressing the phone tighter to her ear. Nikki, it's Tessa. I hear you, sweetheart. I recognized your voice. His silky voice reached Schweitzer, and she breathed a sigh of relief. How are you? The blonde's head spun from such a velvety tone, and she wondered why she hadn't chosen Nicholas back then. Why had she stayed with someone who had lost interest in her? Nikki, I need to meet with you. Are you still in the capital? Tessa said, fearing rejection. I'll fly in from the capital tomorrow just for you, the man replied firmly. I'm not sure Schweitzer will be happy about our meeting. I don't care what he's happy or unhappy about. Tessa shot back, recalling Marilyn. I'll explain everything to you tomorrow. At the Ocean Restaurant by 3 o'clock, I'll be waiting for you. See you, sweetheart. I'll cancel a couple of appointments for you, Nicholas said before hanging up. Warmth flooded through Tessa's body. She set the phone down on the nightstand and sighed quietly. Ilian still hadn't returned and hadn't caused a scene, which made Tessa even more anxious. Off to see his girlfriend, the woman smirked, sipping her wine. You've forgotten yourself, Ilian. I took all that crap from you while I was around. The morning was again less than ideal. Pain pierced her head, her temples throbbed, and the blonde quietly cursed herself for the alcohol she had consumed the night before. There was a persistent knocking at the door, but she didn't open it. She didn't want to see anyone, and the only thing tormenting her now was the meeting with Doros with the one who had once helped her survive in that luxury and the den of snakes. After getting herself together, she finally left her room, catching the shocked stares of the staff. She didn't care at all what they thought of her, nor did she think of them. Coldness was what Tessa had exuded for the last ten years. Everyone in the elite thought she was only like that in public, while at home she sweetly chatted with her husband, spent evenings with a glass of wine, and watched movies as a family. But that was not the case, and unfortunately, it had only been that way for a couple of years. Now she had set herself a goal, to win the divorce from Ilian and put him in his place. Infidelity is unforgivable. If Tessa had been head over heels in love with Ilian, like Martha was with Gustavo, she might have forgiven him and turned a blind eye to the girl she didn't know. But Tessa was a queen and not ready to forgive so easily. Andres, to the ocean, the woman said as she got into the car. And hurry. Did you talk to the boss? The driver asked cautiously. Is everything resolved? I don't want to talk about it. 
I'm still angry with you for your deception, Tessa replied brusquely, staring out the window. She didn't want to discuss her problems with Ilian with anyone. The weather outside was gloomy, as if it were late autumn rather than the beginning of summer, which made the woman feel even sadder. Remembering how her relationship with Schweitzer had begun, Tessa frowned and closed her eyes. She had once thought she had chosen the right path. She managed to save her parents from poverty, if only for a short time. They had died a year after Ilian and Tessa's wedding. She had earned respect in the elite, not only for her beauty and grace, but also for her intelligence and cunning. She had lived as she had once dreamed. But all of that was nothing compared to what she truly thought about, a happy family, children, love, and growing old together. It hadn't worked out. It didn't happen. She had connected herself with the wrong person. We've arrived, Tessa, Andres announced, opening the door for her. Did you wait long? Don't wait. I'll take a taxi home, Tessa concluded, and the guy would have liked to protest, but didn't. It wasn't in his nature. See you, Andres. Entering one of the city's lavish restaurants, the woman looked around, fixed her hair, and headed to the reserved table. Before reaching it, she froze. Nicholas was sitting with his back to Tessa, browsing the menu. The black jacket fit perfectly on his broad, muscular back. He was different from those in the elite, as if he hadn't aged a day since the early 2000s. Nicholas, the blonde said quietly, and he heard her, as if he had always been aware of her presence. He turned around, then stood up and approached her. His hair was as black as coal, his features were perfect and sharp, and those same brown eyes seemed to never lie. His muscular body set him apart from any man in the elite. There was no big belly to confirm his wallet size, no bald spots, and no fat fingers. He was like a damn Apollo. Hello, sweetheart. The man gently kissed Tessa on the cheek and gestured for her to take the seat opposite him. She complied. You're fading, my dear, he said, not taking his eyes off the woman for whom his heart beat. He loved her, loves her, and will love her. Nothing would change that. What happened? Speak, you can trust me. You haven't changed a bit, the woman replied, looking into his brown eyes. It felt as though a hurricane was raging inside her, her blood circulated faster, and her heart pounded with incredible force. You're still so caring. I wouldn't want to use your services or take advantage of you as my safety net if it weren't for this difficult situation, Nikki. You can count on me. I've always said I'd help, no matter what type of help it is. The man covered Tessa's hand with his. Something fluttered inside her. What's wrong? Are you tired? Did something happen in the elite? Haven't the rumors reached you? Tessa interrupted. She knew that wherever Doros was, he was always updated on the situation of families in the elite. If it's about your husband's dubious affair, then yes, I heard, but only this morning, Nicholas began, still not letting go of his love's hand. I also heard you raised quite a scandal with Schweitzer. We're getting a divorce, Tessa blurted out sharply. I want you to be my lawyer and help me destroy his business. I know you and Ilian are old friends, and betrayal is not something you encourage. I know I'm asking for the impossible, but I had to try. He humiliated me. He didn't tell me he no longer sees me as a woman. Only after my scandal did he confess that I'm too old to be seen with him in elite circles. We haven't slept together in years. I'm just a porcelain doll next to him. But I'm alive, Nikki, alive. I endured this coldness for so long, and now I've grown cold myself. He betrayed me. I'm not jealous, no. There's nothing to be jealous of. There's no love. But my pride. He tossed it aside and wiped his feet on it. Everyone in the elite cheats. Yes, I knew what I was getting into. But for so many years, he never cheated, and then, all of a sudden... I want him to pay for my pain, for my suffering, for my loneliness, for his damn betrayal, Nikki. I want to breathe, not sit in a room like a lunatic, alone with a bottle of wine. I'm tired of these games, of the elite's imposed rules. 
I'm a wife. That comes with certain responsibilities. He knew I was proud, that I wouldn't allow myself to be humiliated, and that's why for so many years all the men around didn't hide their mistresses from their wives, while he didn't even have any. I was the only one for so many years, I was the only one. The man silently stood up and wrapped his large, warm hands around the woman's shoulders. It was as if he was absorbing all of Tess's anguish, breaking his heart over and over again. I'm glad you came to me, sweetheart, Nicholas said, pulling the woman close to him. You did the right thing by not letting his betrayal go so easily, even when your feelings have cooled. Remember I told you not to forgive him, and you listened. You're doing everything right, sweetheart. Absolutely right. Your pride is more important than his desire for young women. Your self-esteem is more important than his status. You are more important than he is. To me, you are more important. Tessa slowly raised her head, and Nicholas wiped the tears from her cheeks without breaking eye contact. You were so young when he wanted to make you his, the man continued. He could no longer stay silent. He doesn't know how to love. He never has. He chose you for your looks, for your beauty, for your body that drove men wild. He wanted to possess you like a trophy. That you belong to him and not someone else. He has cheated on you for many years, Tessa. For a very long time. But no one ever told you about it. They filled your head with words that Ilion was the only man worthy of you, that he wouldn't stray, that he would protect your dignity and pride. Women envied you, and men envied him. But everyone stayed silent. No one told you until Martha found out. Now you know she is your only close friend. She confessed to knowing about the affair. For the first time in all these years, someone admitted it. Ilian didn't expect it. He will kill either Gustavo or Martha. There are no other options. The others would never confess. You know, Ilian is at the top of the elite, and everyone knows that crossing him is like signing a death warrant. I moved so far away from here to avoid seeing how they deceive you. If you had called me earlier, I would have come sooner, I would have taken half the business, hell, I would have taken it all for you, Tessa. I will be your lawyer, and I will do everything to leave Schweitzer with nothing. I'll do it for you. The woman couldn't believe her ears. She had been humiliated by her own husband for so many years, but she was only now realizing it. From the man who promised her a better life, but had managed to drag her through the mud. I'm grateful to you, Nicholas, Tessa said, calming down a little. Her heart still ached treacherously. He's obviously already filed for divorce. I want to move out, but you know he never put anything in my name. I don't own any property or cars. Nicholas thought for a moment, then reached into his jacket pocket and pulled out a set of keys. He handed them to Tessa, who frowned and raised her eyebrows. This is my apartment and the car keys. Use them, Doro said, placing the keys into her hand. Don't you dare refuse. You'll need help during the divorce process. Be strong, but not in front of me. I'll accept your weakness and help you, support you. I regret so much that I chose the wrong path, Tessa said bitterly, forgive me. Nicholas didn't respond. He simply held the woman against his broad chest and remained silent. He loved her. He still loved her. Arriving home by taxi, she hurried upstairs to gather her things. Her room was locked. Tessa looked around, confused about what was happening. You won't take anything from this house because it was all bought with my money, Ilian began, stepping out of his bedroom. Don't even think about deceiving me. Get lost, you bastard, the woman snapped, tossing her hair back. Blood boiled in her veins, and fury filled her body and mind. In a week, on Friday, the court. Get ready to be left with nothing, Schweitzer said again, trying to provoke his wife. And don't forget to visit Martha in the hospital. The woman's eyes widened, and she clenched her fists. In a second, she was standing face to face with her husband and delivered a stinging slap to his face. Her palm burned, but not as much as her heart. You're a damn bastard, Ilian, Tessa declared. I will do everything in my power to erase you from the face of the earth. 
While the man was recovering from the shock, rubbing his ridden cheek, Tessa bolted out of the house and ran to Andres. Andres, the woman shouted as the guy lounged in the car, reclining his driver's seat back. You damn Andres. Tessa started banging on the window, and Andres finally woke up. Startled, he quickly pulled a gun from its holster and got out of the car. Did you know that Martha is in the hospital? Tessa, Andres mumbled, lowering his weapon. Without this, Andres. Did you know? The driver nodded silently and immediately received a slap. It wasn't as hard as what Schweitzer had gotten, but it was still a good one. You've all driven me mad. Enough. Tessa shouted, her voice echoing across the courtyard. The security staff stared at the house's owner with surprise as she stood there screaming. I'll choke all of you, you pups. You all annoy me. You annoy me. Andres, what are you waiting for? Let's get to the hospital already. The driver complied, and within a minute, the Mercedes was speeding out of Schweitzer's territory. Bursting into the bright room, Tessa knocked over medical staff and anyone else who got in her way. She was too furious and angry to be polite. Vera, Martha, what room? Tessa asked a woman sitting at the reception desk. Ma'am, didn't they teach you to greet people? The unpleasant voice of the nurse sounded, and Tessa clenched her jaw. I'm Tessa, damn it, Schweitzer. I don't care about greetings. The room, the blonde exclaimed, and the nurse gulped, quickly starting to search for something on the computer. Third floor, to the right, room 517. VIP, the woman rattled off, and Tessa nodded, leaving the reception area. As she rushed past offices and wards, the woman felt dizzy and had to brace herself against the white walls to avoid falling. Her head spun, and her legs weakened. Not understanding what was happening, Tessa lost consciousness, not making it to her friend's room. I found myself in warmth. A warm, bright place that felt like home. White rays enveloped my body as if in a cocoon. A strange tingling in my heart made it hard to concentrate. I was somewhere that perhaps not everyone could reach. Beeping machines. Voices. Cries and tears. I was waking up from a sleep where I had felt wonderful. She'll be all right, an unfamiliar voice murmured. What's all this about? Nicholas asked, standing at the head of the hospital bed. Stress, anxiety. The woman has some minor heart murmurs, but we'll check it again and provide a definitive answer, the doctor concluded, rubbing his brow. She'll wake up in no more than ten minutes. She needs rest. It's all my fault in Schweitzer's, Martha said, wiping tears from her cheeks. Martha, Tessa whispered softly, trying to open her eyes. How are you? Shoo, girl, be quiet, Vera mumbled grabbing her friend's hand. You need to rest. How are you? Tessa pressed on, still anxious. I'm fine, Tess. It's all Schweitzer. He locked me in this damn hospital without a phone or any way to contact you. He really wanted to kill me, but Gustavo wouldn't allow it. He got into trouble because of me and my big mouth, Martha said sadly, and Tessa finally opened her eyes. In front of her stood an anxious Nicholas, while Martha sat near the bed. Pain filled Tessa's heart. She had been so worried about her friend that she had lost consciousness, while Schweitzer only wanted to torment her. Bastard, Tessa spat, squeezing her friend's hand. I want to kill him. You can't get worked up, Nicholas said, moving to the head of the bed. You're too weak right now. You need to sleep. I need to get rid of my husband, who's tormenting me, not sleep, Tessa growled, closing her eyes in anger. Every part of her body longed to free herself from everything that tied her to her husband, especially his last name. The court is next Friday, Tessa said without opening her eyes. I need to get the flash drive from my room, where all the documentation for that idiot's business is. Nicholas frowned and began pacing back and forth. Compromising material? Martha asked, not leaving Tessa's side. Aren't you afraid? I have nothing left to be afraid of, darling. And it's better for you to pretend I'm not here. Though the Swede will find out. 
Don't worry, I won't drag you into this anymore, Tessa concluded. I will make him regret everything he's done. Nicholas slowly led his friend into the apartment he had personally allocated for her. Dark hardwood floors, panoramic windows, and a living room combined with a kitchen. The air was filled with the scent of vanilla, which Tessa loved. It's so cozy here, the woman said with a smile as she walked deeper into the apartment. The man didn't respond, merely shrugged. He enjoyed seeing Tessa smile and revel in the moment. They sat down on a dark leather sofa. Tessa gasped as she sat on the cold surface, but quickly composed herself. The company in the setting for the evening seemed more than perfect to her. It was already getting dark outside, the living room was softly lit, and Nicholas decided to seize the opportunity and pulled out a hidden bottle of 10-year-old whiskey. I won't offer you any, you can't have it, Nicholas said, pouring only one glass. I can have anything, Tessa laughed, walking over to the bar counter located in the middle of the kitchen. I take it there's no wine? Doros nodded positively. Tessa grimaced. She snatched the glass from the man's hands and drained it, satisfied as she closed her eyes. Warmth spread throughout her body, and her limbs relaxed. The friends sat and chatted, enjoying the atmosphere, forgetting what was happening beyond those walls. Does Schweitzer know you're in town? Tessa asked sharply, examining the sharp features of her companion's face. No, otherwise he wouldn't have let you roam free so calmly, Nicholas replied, finishing his drink in one go. Tessa swallowed nervously. She hoped Ilian wasn't aware of Doros' obvious feelings for her. But I thought Ilian didn't know about your, Tessa hesitated, unsure of how to express herself. Thoughts in her head were tangled. My feelings for you? Nicholas said calmly, then burst into laughter. Tessa followed his smile, and the corners of her mouth involuntarily lifted. His laughter was incredibly beautiful. Sincere. Schweitzer knew, just like the entire elite. But by his orders, no one told you. Did you forget how damn happy he was when I left for Moscow? Tessa tensed, recalling how her husband had been incredibly jealous of her relationships with other men in the elite but not of Doros. Even when the latter held her closely during a dance, more than just as friends, her husband had shown no aggression. Why has he never interfered with our communication? The woman asked, moving to the bar to bring a bottle of whiskey into the living room. I remember when Vera wasn't married and asked me for a dance at one of the receptions, Schweitzer nearly broke his arm. There was obvious jealousy. Nicholas looked into Tessa's eyes and licked his lower lip, expressing desire. He wanted her, loved her, desired her. He knew I wouldn't take you away, Nicholas began, pouring shivers for himself and his friend. He's too well aware of me and my desires. Others in the elite were bastards. They could take what didn't belong to them by force, without reciprocity. I prefer mutual consent. If you had said you wanted to leave Ilian back then, I would have taken you by the hand and whisked you away. I need reciprocity. Attraction. Desire. Love. The woman swallowed hard. Her head spun from the words that whirled around in her mind. Attraction. Desire. Love. All of it was inside Tessa, locked deep in her heart under the heaviest, most massive lock. It was as if Nicholas was about to unlock it, saving everything Tessa had sworn never to reveal. I liked you. You were the good guy among those thugs, Tessa began, trying to hold back the tremor in her voice. And Ilian was that bad guy, and I fell for him. Like a fool. You weren't foolish, sweetheart, you were just young, Nicholas concluded, moving closer to the woman. She didn't pull away. She simply laid her head on his broad chest and burst into tears. She realized her mistake again. Once more. Three days had passed since Tessa left the Schweitzer house. Living alone in Nicholas's apartment, she had plenty of time to think. She started searching for information about that very Marilyn her husband hid so well. She needed to know what she was like and why she had chosen to get involved with such an old man. Martha, I'm really fine, Tessa said, pressing the phone to her ear while scrolling through articles on Doros's laptop. 
What reception? Yes, I'll be there. I'm coming with Doros. So that jerk understands that I deserve better, Tessa finished and hung up. A charity evening was planned in honor of one of the wealthy men's sons joining the elite. Tessa was obligated to attend to maintain her dignity and authority. After calling Nicholas to inform him about the event, he happily agreed to appear before their old friends. A sense of calm had enveloped the woman for more than a couple of days. She was only anxious about the flash drive that she desperately needed right now. She had to take the risk. Frantically dialing Andreas's number, she set the laptop aside and waited for an answer. Andres, hi, the blonde began, wanting to make sure he was alone. Hello, Tessa, came the voice on the other end of the line. Tessa sighed with relief. He was definitely alone. I need your help. There's a reception at Lizarus's house today, Tessa said. I know you're loyal to Ilian, but you've also been loyal to me during your entire time working. I'm listening. I need you to sneak into my room during the party while Ilian is there and get my thing. The flash drive is hidden in the mattress on the left side, at the headboard. You'll need to cut the mattress. That's dangerous, Tessa. If Ilian finds out, I'll end up like Sergio. Tessa took a deep breath. Sergio had been killed when he tried to take new crystal glasses from the Schweitzer house at his wife's request. The death had been instantaneous. Ilian was too cruel. No one will notice you, that's one. Secondly, I won't let Schweitzer touch you. You know I keep my word, Tessa reassured him. Just do it. Please. I won't shortchange you. I have another request, Tessa. I'm listening. If you do leave Ilian, and it goes well, take me with you as your bodyguard. You've become too dear to me, Andres confessed, and Tessa involuntarily smiled. I'll do it for you. And I'll do everything to make sure you leave with me, Tessa concluded and hung up. It had grown dark outside, and Doros arrived at the apartment. The sharp scent of citrus mixed with wood wafted through the house, reaching the woman. As she stepped out of her room, she caught the smell and stopped. It was the very scent of the perfume she had sensed in the middle of the hall at her wedding. Ilian had doused himself in overly sharp fragrances, which made her stomach turn. But this scent was one she remembered through the years. Why? She didn't know. Nervously swallowing, Tessa stepped out of the shadows, and the man looked her up and down. She wore a luxurious floor-length dress in a dark red color, reminiscent of blood. The perfect cut accentuated every curve of her body, with a slit up to her thigh on the left leg and a V-shaped neckline. She looked like a damn painting in the Louvre. Just as beautiful, alluring, and mesmerizing. Her legs were adorned with sleek high-heeled sandals. Nicholas swallowed, realizing how desire twisted his insides into a nautical knot. The woman who had looked better than Naomi Campbell in her youth now looked even better at her current age. Her hair lay in smooth strands on her bare shoulders, and her lips were adorned with dark lipstick. She didn't need makeup or jewelry to stand out. She was a diamond in her own right. What a damn treasure, Nicholas whispered to himself, hoping he hadn't said it out loud. Tessa furrowed her brows, not understanding what her friend was mumbling. You look like a damn treasure, Tessa, Doro said, now louder, extending his hand to the woman. You look like someone who has searched for it for a long time, Tessa whispered with a smile, standing on her tiptoes to reach Nicholas's ear. He was dressed in a black tuxedo with a white shirt. He exuded boldness, confidence, and sex appeal. Schweitzer had definitely picked up on that. After descending from the third floor, Nicholas graciously opened the car door for Tessa and then took the driver's seat. No driver? Tessa asked, adjusting the hem of her dress, and no security either? I don't like unnecessary people when I'm with such an ideal woman, the brunette confessed, starting the car while keeping his gaze fixed on Tessa's neck. I don't understand how Schweitzer could cheat on you. Let's go, Nicholas, Tessa laughed. I want to see the faces of everyone in the elite when I show up without Ilian. Everything felt too perfect. Signingly so. Smiles. People. 
Dishes. A green garden surrounding the luxurious mansion, glowing with yellow lights. Gates surrounded by dozens of men in black suits, each hiding at least two guns in their holsters. Women adorned with jewelry worth more than the apartments of some residents of the country. Men whose thick fingers held their wives' waists so possessively that it was nauseating. Too pretentious, too much farce. Ilian stood with his back to the gates, chatting with his close friend Gustavo. Ordinary discussions about business and evenings spent away from their wives. Martha, dressed in a black midi dress, walked across the lawn in her new Louboutins, which her husband had bought for her after another affair. Hypocrisy. She approached Vera and wrapped her arms around his neck, showing everyone that he was hers. But no one cared. All eyes were directed elsewhere. A girl, who could easily be a daughter to many present, walked down the gravel path toward Schweitzer and Vera's table. Long legs, black hair, empty eyes, and a young body clad in a silk green slip. Good evening, she stammered, coming close to Ilian. His face turned red with anger. He clearly hadn't expected her. Marilyn, what the hell are you doing here? Schweitzer growled, trying to hide his irritation. He was failing miserably. I came to the evening where my favorite man is present, the young woman announced, piercing her gaze through the shocked Martha. If you wanted to say that mistresses don't show up here, let me tell you that your wife also didn't come alone. Schweitzer's eyes immediately scanned the hall, hoping to see the one his Latvian girlfriend was referring to. You shouldn't have shown up here without my permission, Ilian hissed, and Gustavo, who was sitting nearby, burst out laughing. I see, Schweitzer, you're a fan of women with character, Vera said. Shut up, Ilian growled, grabbing his unwanted companion by the forearm. Get back inside the house right now. You don't belong here. Not yet. Are you sure? Marilyn purred, directing her gaze at the gates. Tessa, arm in arm with Doros, entered the garden, beaming. Her eyes sparkled, and her skin glowed, as if she had risen from the ashes. What the hell is Doros doing here? Ilian almost shouted, while Martha smiled victoriously at that moment. She had been waiting for this show. She was confident in her friend. The woman felt secure next to someone who walked proudly beside her, chin held high. Nicholas scanned the garden and immediately noticed the intense, resentful gaze of his friend. Attention shifted to Victor Lysiras, who was eagerly rushing toward the couple. Thrush, it's been so long since I've seen you, exclaimed the man, whose belly was three times larger than his head. You finally accepted my invitation to the reception. As you can see, Lise, good evening, Nicholas said, extending his hand for a greeting. Tessa? Where's your husband? Victor asked slyly, trying to provoke non-existent feelings in the woman's heart. And you don't know, she replied with a smile, unwilling to rise to the bait. That wasn't part of her plans for today. Well, I heard you're getting a divorce. What a pity. If I weren't married, I would have swooped you away from Ilian, Lysir has laughed, but fell silent immediately when he saw Nicholas's tense fists. The muscles in his face twitched. He was ready to grab the throat of the fat, arrogant fool and snap it. I'm not a carrier pigeon to be intercepted, Victor. Have a good evening, Tessa said proudly, moving forward and dragging the furious Doros behind her. Don't pay attention, Tessa whispered, calming her companion. Those rats aren't worth your irritation. Nicholas smiled and followed the woman. All the guests stared at that very ideal woman of the elite, who was now not with her husband, but with a stunning man whom not everyone recognized. His distinguishing feature was that he seemed not to have aged. He was too handsome and fit compared to the others present. My girl, Martha exclaimed, approaching her friend. She was clearly nervous, but tried not to show it. Are you with Nikita? Tessa smirked. Martha knew her friend would come with Doros, but she couldn't let that show. Tessa hugged her friend and kissed her on both cheeks. Nicholas, in a gentlemanly manner, kissed the back of Vera's hand and gifted her his dazzling white smile. 
Ilian is ready to blow a fuse. Guys, his girlfriend came here without his invitation, and you're here together, Martha whispered, trying not to draw attention. I feel like it's going to be a fun night. Is the famed Latvian really here? The blonde asked with a smirk, still holding onto the man's elbow. Shall we go over, Nikita? He merely nodded in approval, and now the trio was heading toward the table, which crackled with the aggression around it. Dear friend, Nicholas exclaimed, raising his arms for a hug as he looked into Ilian's eyes, which burned with anger. Aren't you going to hug me? You damn bastard, Ilian growled and lunged at his friend with his fists. A fierce fight broke out, but Nicholas clearly surpassed his opponent in every way. Let him go, you psycho. Tessa shouted, held back by Martha. A crowd gathered around the two men, watching it all as if it were a show. Break them up. No one dared to intervene in such situations, and Tessa couldn't bear to see a small drop of blood trickle from Nicholas's lip. Her heart tightened. Why? Nicholas had taken down his longtime friend with one punch and was now on his feet, wiping the blood from his face. Is this how you greet friends? Doro smirked, adjusting the collar of his shirt. Tessa immediately rushed to her friend, pulling tissues from her bag and dabbing at the torn lip on Nicholas's face. You came with my wife. Mine. Ilian shouted as he stood up from the ground. The suit that cost a couple of thousand dollars was stained green in places, mixed with black. He was boiling with rage, his face smeared with blood, and a button had popped off his shirt. How dare you? We're in the process of getting a divorce, you damn psycho. Tessa interjected, shielding Nicholas with her back. I came with someone I consider worthy. So I'm not worthy? Ilian sneered, glancing at the crowd. Everyone here carries out my orders, hoping that I'll pull their asses out of jail if needed. I'm, damn it, the king here. You've forgotten, my friend, that a king without a queen is equivalent to a pawn, Nicholas spoke up, and the crowd chuckled. They were afraid of Schweitzer, but evidently not as much as he thought. Don't you dare talk about worthiness. Bringing a mistress into the elite without being divorced from your wife is low, my friend. Whispers spread among the couples, and everyone began looking around, searching for that very mistress. She was nowhere to be found. It was as if she had vanished into thin air. You said you would never take her from me, Ilian began, ignoring those around him. You swore. I haven't broken my oath, Doros replied, while next to him, proudly lifting her chin, stood the very queen. She is not my wife or my woman. She is my companion for this evening. But that's just a matter of time. She left you. You are no longer together. My oath was that I wouldn't take her from your grasp, which you loosened many years ago. You don't love her. So don't talk to me about oaths. And now I want to say something, Tessa said, surveying the guests. My ex-man cheated on me. I'm not one of you, and I can't forgive such a transgression for a handbag or expensive shoes. I choose myself and my dignity over money. I'm divorcing Schweitzer for this reason, and I... Tessa didn't get to finish as Ilian interrupted her. I'm the one divorcing you. You're too old for the elite. Oh really? The woman smirked, noticing how Nicholas tensed next to her. Every man in this garden is willing to do anything to take your place beside me. They don't agree with my age. Be a man. Admit that you're pathetic. Tessa nodded to everyone present, and Nicholas, taking her hand in his, began leading her toward the gates. Proudly, firmly, like a man. You are nobody and nothing without me. Ilian shouted after his old friend and wife. He couldn't come to terms with such shame. He wanted to destroy them both. Clenching his fists, he angrily strode toward the mansion to compose himself. He opened the first bathroom that crossed his path and roared with anger. Marilyn, damn it, not here, he yelled, lifting the limp body from the cold tiles. Tessa's phone rang just as she and Nicholas got into the car. Are you okay? The woman asked, pulling her mobile from her bag. Nicholas nodded briefly and started the engine. Andres, I'm listening, Tessa replied, 
and Doros raised his eyebrows, looking at his companion. Jealousy flared up in his heart, but he held it back. Where should I take you, Tessa? Andre said cheerfully. Tessa sighed with relief. I heard you made quite a stir with your gentleman at Lizarus's. You heard correctly, my dear, Schweitzer replied. I'll send you the address, come by tomorrow. But no tales, just us. At your service, Tessa. Signing off, Andres murmured and hung up. If you're wondering who my dear Andres is, I'll tell you, the woman laughed, looking at Nicholas's swollen lip. He's my driver. Too loyal. It doesn't matter, Nicholas mumbled, and a second later, he pressed his bloodied lips against Tessa's. She was taken aback and momentarily froze before Nicholas's tongue slipped into her mouth. The kiss was sensual, filled with longing, desire, and love. I've waited 21 years, Tessa. Don't judge me, Doro said, pulling away from the woman to catch his breath. I've dreamed. Once again, a commanding, pleasant, tender kiss. The woman had no intention of pushing the man away. On the contrary, she was savoring the moment. Finally, she felt truly loved, desired, even at her age. She wanted to hit pause on her entire life so this could last forever. Butterflies fluttered in her stomach, sparks flashed before her eyes as she closed them, her hands turned to jelly as she ran them through his silky dark hair, and her legs felt weak as Doros's hands explored the curves of her waist. You're too perfect for this world, Nicholas whispered, leaving wet trails on the delicate skin of Tessa's neck, which arched under his touch. You deserve better, sweetheart. I've realized I chose the wrong one, Tessa barely managed to say, indulging in sensations she hadn't felt in so long. I liked you, but I was foolish. I met you too late. It's never too late, Nicholas replied, running his calloused fingers along the exposed thigh of the woman. I'll do everything to ensure not even a speck of Schweitzer remains. And again, the kiss. Passionate. Strong. Depleting her strength. Waking up in bed not alone for the first time in years, Tessa jolted. Her head lay on the muscular shoulder of a man whose face was buried in her blonde hair. She smiled as her body trembled from the gentle touch of his hand on her back. Awake, are we? Nicholas murmured, inhaling the scent of Tessa's hair. Beautiful. Oh, you flatterer, the blonde laughed, pulling the blanket over her head. Her face flushed from the morning compliments. The court is soon. A sad voice came from under the blanket, and Nicholas frowned. He was prepared for it, and there was no problem in claiming half of what they had acquired. He was a top-notch lawyer who had handled thousands of cases in the capital, but here, where everyone obeyed Schweitzer, it was more complicated. He needed solid evidence of illegal business activities to seize his assets and put him behind bars. When will your flash drive be with you? The man asked, running his hand over the white fabric right across the woman's body. Today. Hand me the phone on the nightstand. Andres will bring it. Can he be trusted? Absolutely. He wants to be my bodyguard after I claim most of Schweitzer's assets. What a persistent guy. Does he happen to have feelings for you, like I do? Nicholas asked, and Tessa jumped out from under the blanket. A smile beamed on her face. He's ten years younger than me, dear, the woman replied. I don't think I'm his type. Nicholas nodded approvingly and kissed his beloved on the forehead. Throwing off the cover, he slipped into a white robe and headed to the kitchen, leaving the woman alone with her thoughts. She felt so happy that the smile never left her face. The phone rang right in her hands. Andres? Tessa asked, hearing the guy's heavy breathing on the other end. Is everything okay? It seems we have a problem, Andres mumbled. I'll be at your place in about 40 minutes, and I urgently need a hideout. Tessa jumped up from the bed in fear and stared at the screen just as Andres had already ended the call. Nicholas, the woman shouted, it looks like they caught Andres. Tessa paced back and forth, waiting for Andres. She was scared for him, she knew what Ilian did to traitors, so her heart raced wildly and her hands trembled. There was an insistent ringing at the door. 
Nicholas retrieved a gun from the kitchen drawer, approached the door, and carefully opened it. There stood Andres, safe and sound, breathing heavily. Without a second thought, the blonde rushed to him with open arms. First, she served him tea, then seated him in the living room, sitting across from Doros. And now, Andres, let's take it step by step, Nicholas began, and Andres sighed heavily. I did everything you asked, the guy said, pulling a small flash drive from his pocket and handing it to Tessa. But that silly maid, Diana, saw me when I was leaving your bedroom. I paid her to keep quiet. 30,000, I hope she won't spill. After I called you, Ilian returned half an hour later with some young girl in his arms. I thought she had fallen asleep or maybe had too much champagne at the reception. I didn't pay much attention. Then I was surprised to see her looking so pale. I decided to follow him. Ilian laid her down on the couch in the living room where the panoramic windows are. He started shaking her, but she showed no emotion. He began rummaging through her bag, found some container, and poured a few pills into her mouth. She woke up, started coughing, then was thrashing around as if she didn't realize what was happening. I've seen that before when my mom took strong sedatives before she passed away. The guy lowered his head and frowned. Marilyn? Tessa asked Nicholas, as if voicing her suspicions. Doros nodded. She started hitting Schweitzer, and he was holding her close, Andres continued. Then, from the other side of the living room, Diana opened a window, and I went over there to hear what they were saying. Go on, Andres, Tessa urged, retrieving a bottle of whiskey from the bar. She saw how difficult it was for Andres as soon as he remembered his mother. He had become a complete orphan at just 19. After burying his father and mother, his sister and her husband had also died from drugs. He still missed them, and that was okay. Anyway, she was telling him that she couldn't live without them, Andre said, downing a glass of whiskey that Tessa had brought him. She said she would do anything just so he wouldn't send her back to Latvia. He told her he would give her as much as she needed. Without what can she not live? Nicholas asked, leaning his elbows on his thighs. Pills, Tessa declared, knowing how hard it was for Andres to talk about this. That's why she's with him. He supplies her with money so she can buy that poison. Without further ado, Nicholas pulled out his laptop and began entering some unknown database to Tessa. Do you know the last name? Doros asked. Andres nodded and named it. Marilyn Jansen, daughter of a well-known restaurateur, Alexei Jansen. She was tried for possession and trafficking of narcotic substances in significant quantities, Doros began. He quickly copied the name and pasted it into a standard browser search. The first two search results were news articles, and the next two were regular sites. A well-known owner of the Italian restaurant chain Ciao Bella caught his daughter using pills that have a strong impact on the mind. A few days later, an operational group discovered 15 kilograms of narcotic substances in the room of the 23-year-old girl, Nicholas concluded. Most likely, this Alexei cut off his daughter's money so she would stop buying that crap, and Ilian happily helped her do so, Tessa said. He's a fool. He knows the elite's rules. No drugs. And we'll bring him down in front of all his buddies and subordinates, Nicholas assured, smiling triumphantly. He knows the laws of the elite and won't be able to go against them. Exile? Andres asked cautiously. Tessa and Nicholas nodded. You, Andres, are a very good guy, Doro said, patting the young man on the shoulder. Only now all of Schweitzer's subordinates are looking for this good guy, Andres mumbled, sighing heavily. Diana turned me in this morning. Don't worry, Tessa reassured him, you'll stay here, and today I'll need Martha's help to put Schweitzer in his place. By four o'clock, Tessa was sitting in the ocean, waiting for her friend. Martha was slightly upset with Tessa for her remarks at the reception, but realized that the words had been true. After greeting each other, the women began discussing the previous evening, which hadn't gone very well. Martha was once again talking about Vera's infidelities, while Tessa chose not to share her nighttime adventures in bed with Doros. She felt that now was not the right time. 
You seem tense, Tess, Martha said, sipping her wine. The waiter brought hot dishes and quickly disappeared from view. Did Schweitzer block your cards? I'm using Nicholas's card, Schweitzer replied, lowering her eyes guiltily. Wow. It sounds like you have a romance brewing. Martha exclaimed, smiling broadly. She always seemed so frivolous and naive, yet at the same time vulnerable and resilient. She had been married to Vera for only nine years, but had integrated into the elite quite well, especially by becoming Tess's best friend, which solidified her place in the circle. By the way, I forgot to ask, how's Marilyn? Tessa inquired. Is she beautiful? Well, not as stunning as you, but she's not bad. Long-legged, like a model, Martha concluded as she began eating her seafood pasta. Yesterday, Schweitzer took off with her right after you left. Did you see how they left? The blonde couldn't calm down. The medallions on her plate were already getting cold. No, they exited through the back door. Well, that's what Gustavo said, Martha replied, continuing to eat. Tessa smiled triumphantly. He hides her from everyone just because of his dependency. What a fool. Martha, dear, don't you have any news for me? Tessa asked again, observing her friend. She had already salted her pasta four times, and her breasts had noticeably increased in size. Tessa couldn't understand what was wrong with the brunette. Well, not really, Vera said uncertainly, reaching for the salt shaker again and frowning. Is your cycle okay? Tessa inquired. Are you healthy? Well, there's a slight delay, a couple of days, the woman hesitated. Well, a week. Wait for me, okay? The brunette nodded, looking at her friend with a puzzled expression. Grabbing her bag, Tessa rushed to the pharmacy around the corner from the restaurant. After buying the most expensive pregnancy test, she headed back. Okay, Martha, go to the bathroom, Tessa said, placing a small box in her friend's hand. Hurry up, dear. Realizing what was expected of her, the brunette instantly jumped up and ran to the restroom. Tessa couldn't sit still while waiting. She even indulged in the cold dish and finished off the bottle of white wine. She was so anxious that it felt as if she could be the one who was pregnant. After ten minutes, a pale Martha returned to the table, holding the very box. Her eyes were wide open, and her palms were slick with sweat. Tessa furrowed her brow and leaned over the table to hear the result. Well? Martha, what's wrong? Tessa quietly asked, taking her friend's hand in hers. I'm pregnant, Tess, Martha said, her voice distant, as if she didn't quite understand. Images of the past flashed in Tess's mind. To hell with it all. Martha shouted, throwing a vase that stood in the corner of the room against the wall. He's going to leave me. Tessa didn't know what to say to support her friend and just hugged her, preventing her from destroying more things in the house. The girl's body trembled as if an electric current were passing through her. I'm infertile, Tess. Do you understand? Gustavo will leave me. I'm not good enough. Martha screamed again, bursting into tears right into her friend's shoulder. Tessa fell into a stupor, realizing the whole situation. At a loss for words, she sat beside Martha on the couch and took the test from the box lying on the table. Two lines. Pregnant. Let's go, Tessa said, immediately calling the waiter. The check, please. In a minute, the blonde had already paid the bill and was pulling her friend by the hand out of the restaurant. Where to? Martha asked, still in shock. To the hospital. To Jorge, Tessa replied and began hailing a taxi. You're not kidding, are you? Martha whispered, disbelieving, as she stepped out from behind the screen. Am I really pregnant? It's true, dear, Jorge said, stretching into a smile. You did undergo treatment. It helped, even if just a little. After three years, you made it. Oh my God, Martha whispered, tears rolling down her cheeks. Tears of joy. But I'll need to monitor you, the doctor concluded. You do understand that a first pregnancy at 35 is already late. 
Yes, of course, Vera said, wiping away her tears. I just want to share the news with my husband. Tessa sat near the doctor's desk, beaming with a smile. She was so happy for her friend that she was almost ready to cry along with her. Martha immediately grabbed her phone and started calling Gustavo. Gustavo, I'm sorry if I'm interrupting you. I have joyful news to share, the woman said, pacing around the office. I'm pregnant. Pregnant. For weeks along. I love you, Martha said, and hung up. Tessa, Jorge, I'm inviting you both to our place tonight at 9. Gustavo is planning to celebrate this day. He's over the moon. At home, Tessa prepared the most delicious lasagna for Andres to have dinner while she and Nicholas went to celebrate Martha's pregnancy. They both understood they would encounter Schweitzer again, but there was no choice. Martha was Tessa's best friend, and she had to be there, and given her relationship with Nicholas, he had to go with her. Andres, the lasagna is on the table, and the drinks are in the bar. Make yourself at home, Nicholas said as he exited the bedroom. Behind him, Tessa walked in one of the elegant dresses that Doros had bought. Thank you for taking him into your home, the woman whispered, kissing the brunette on the cheek. He's a very good, loyal guy to you, Nicholas concluded, hugging Tessa and inhaling the scent of her blonde hair. It was as if he was getting his fix when he touched his beloved. If anyone asks about Andres, say you don't know him. Don't give yourself away. My people have already prepared the documentation for the court. Tessa nodded, and after saying goodbye to Andres, they locked the apartment and headed to the parking lot. Let's stop somewhere if the jewelry stores are open. We'll buy a gift for Martha. Once the trial is over, I'll pay you back for everything you've spent during this time, Tessa said, applying lipstick in the car mirror. The muscles in the man's arms tensed on the steering wheel, and he frowned. Don't ever say that again, Doros began. I can provide for my woman. I will never reproach you for it not being your money. I'm not him. Tessa looked at the man apologetically and immediately wrapped her arms around his forearm, then pressed her lips to his. As for the gift, there's a bag from Cartier in the back. As soon as you called, I asked for it, and they brought it to me, Nicholas said, breaking into a smile after the woman's gentle kiss. Wow! Tessa exclaimed, pulling a velvet box with a ring from the bag. Did you buy her a ring? A chain and a ring for you, and a bracelet for Martha. For me? My woman deserves the best, but for now, just Cartier. You're crazy, Tessa concluded, kissing the man as passionately as she could. Arriving at the Varus house in the elite neighborhood, Tessa and Nicholas immediately called Martha to let her know they had arrived. A couple of minutes later, they were let through the gates, and at the door of the huge house stood a happy brunette, hugging her husband. Congratulations, Martha and Gustavo, Nicholas said, handing the bag to the woman. She jumped joyfully and hugged her friends. Hello, draws, long time no see, Gustavo winked at the old acquaintance and extended his hand for a handshake. Hello, Vera, Nicholas replied. Inside the house, most of the families had already gathered, but not everyone was there. The Veras had good relationships with everyone, but they didn't want to throw a big celebration. Sitting down in their places, Tessa started chatting with Martha while Nicholas exchanged pleasantries with old friends and colleagues. Soft music played in the background, the sound of clinking glasses and whispers of guests could be heard from afar. Suddenly, Martha broke away from the conversation with her friend and directed her gaze at the door. Schweitzer entered, holding onto the arm of a young girl with large dark bags under her eyes. From a distance, she looked perfectly normal, but up close, it was clear she was unwell. Vera, congratulations on the inheritance. Schweitzer exclaimed, shaking his friend's hand. His companion remained silent. By the way, at your celebration, I want to make a small announcement so that everyone knows. Vera nodded and led the guests to the table. As soon as everyone was seated, Gustavo tapped his knife against his whiskey glass and drew the attention of the attendees. So, dear guests, we have gathered today for a very special and joyful occasion. Gustavo began. 
As you know, due to my work, I lost my first wife Elena and my son Miguel in an accident 13 years ago. I still love them with all my heart and soul, and I will never stop remembering them. But after years, I met her, a beautiful, intelligent, and devoted woman who melted my heart. And now, after nine years of a happy, memory-filled marriage, my wonderful wife Martha has told me that she will soon give me a child. I am incredibly happy about this event and want to celebrate this joyful day with my loved ones. Please congratulate me, I will soon be a father. The sound of clinking glasses and applause erupted, and then Gustavo, without hesitation, gave Martha a passionate, grateful kiss. She squealed joyfully as he whispered something in her ear. In light of this gift to me, I am giving my wife 25% of the shares in my company. Gustavo exclaimed, and a buzz arose in the mansion again. And now, I want to give the floor to my close friend to share an important announcement with everyone present. Schweitzer, the floor is yours. Tessa swallowed nervously when she heard the painfully familiar nickname. Nicholas squeezed the woman's hand under the table, silently assuring her that he was there. Casually rising from the table, he took his young companion's hand, and she stood up behind him. Her face and gaze showed no emotion. She looked like a dressed-up doll that had been brought to the party. As you all know, in the coming days, I will be divorcing my wife, Tysia, Ilian pointed to the woman sitting far from him and smirked. Nicholas clenched his jaw. But I am committed to my choice until she proves otherwise. Tessa has lost her charm, and I have found it. Young, beautiful, loving me not for money and power, but for my soul and tenderness. Laughter echoed through the hall, but Tessa only smiled, knowing the truth of this love. Therefore, I want to introduce you to my new companion in life, Marilyn, Ilian said, and all attention shifted to the long-legged brunette. Not sharing, shouted some rude man, and Schweitzer shot him a nasty grin. Don't you want to share with your friends the story of your meeting? Nicholas interjected, causing Tessa to raise her eyebrows in surprise. I'm sure everyone would love to hear how you brought a drug addict into the elite and are presenting her as your life partner. Schweitzer? Vera shouted, jumping up from the head of the table. What's he talking about? You said she was only charged with trafficking. The eyes of the attendees widened. They clearly did not know these details, but Tessa and Nicholas were informed. She does look like she's high, Lizerass said, darting between Schweitzer's and Vera's gazes. Drost, I give you my word in my house, since Schweitzer can't explain himself, Vera said, causing Ilian's face to turn as red as a tomato. If you're aware of the news, then you know of a businessman, Jansons, a Latvian, Drost concluded, rising from the table. This is his daughter, who has been on pills for a long time. And your beloved king supplies them to her. Even now, as Liza put it, she's high. We all know the laws of the elite. Drugs are forbidden. The punishment is exile. Do you want to exile me? Schweitzer shouted, jumping up from his seat. I created this elite. Don't forget yourself, friend, Nicholas continued. You know very well that my father created it. You were the only one in the know, and now you decide to go for deception? A murmur spread through the mansion, and Marta, overwhelmed by stress, sank into a chair. Tessa immediately rushed to her friend and began to calm her. The elite was started by Fadi, Luna, Liza's wife, told me, Marta whispered. That's right, Fadi, Tessa replied, not taking her eyes off Nicholas, as a puzzle clicked into place in her mind. Fadi was named Roman, his last name is unknown. But Nicholas's father was also named Roman. What? Marta muttered as the argument at the table escalated further. Fadi is your father? Vera interrupted, looking at his friends in confusion. Exactly, Nicholas concluded. And if you want a real exile, I'll bring my father here. Is he alive? The murmur spread throughout the floor. Seriously? Schweitzer, you'd better leave my table, Gustavo growled. You are no longer a welcome guest in my house. Burning with anger and hatred, Ilian grabbed his young girlfriend by the hand and stormed out of the mansion, his heels sparkling. 
After Schweitzer left the Varus house, the men went outside, discussing the resurrection of Fadi himself and the situation with Schweitzer. Tessa led Marta to a room, grabbing a jug of juice for her friend and a glass of wine for herself. What the hell just happened? Marta asked, lying on the bed. So, the creator of the elite is Drost's father, but he kept it a secret? It seems so, Tessa replied, unsure of her answer. Fadi is alive, and Schweitzer brought a dependent into the elite, hiding it from everyone? Tessa nodded. What on earth is going on? Marta exclaimed, placing her palm on her forehead. This is news. Honestly, I didn't expect Nicholas to reveal everything about Marilyn today, Tessa admitted, sipping her wine. So you knew? Exactly. Well, you're a chicken, girlfriend, the brunette huffed, pouring juice into a glass. You could have warned me, I wouldn't have stressed out so much. Sorry, Nicholas asked to keep quiet until he figures out the dirt on Schwetz. And what? Did you find anything? Yes. All the illegal stuff I had stored on the flash drive, Doro sent it where it needed to go. He won't stand a chance in court. You're very brave, Tessa, Vera said, stroking her flat stomach. And very vengeful. The women burst into laughter, and there was a knock at the door. Martha allowed the person in, and Luna, Lisa's wife, slipped into the room. Martha, just don't panic, the woman said, her face not promising anything good. Gustavo, Nicholas, Victor, and Sergio are there. In short, the ambulance is already on the way. What? Tessa and Martha exclaimed together. Shilling, Luna replied. Martha swallowed hard, and a second later, her eyes rolled back, her legs buckled, and she lost consciousness. Damn it! Tessa cried out indignantly, catching her friend. Everything was getting too dangerous. In the hospital, there was a woman's desperate scream. As soon as Martha came to, she went crazy. She cried, fought, struggled with the guards to see her wounded husband. On a bench near the intensive care unit sat Luna and Tessa, burning a hole in the wall with their intense gazes. Only Martha and Anna screamed so loudly that the glass around threatened to shatter. As soon as they injected Varys with a sedative, the hospital became a tone quieter. I just found him, Tessa whispered to herself. Andres burst into the corridor, looking around. Tessa, the guy shouted, are you okay? How did you get out of the apartment? The woman asked, not taking her eyes off the wall. We locked you in. The guards told me, I was worried about you. I kicked down the door. I'll put everything back, I swear, Andres babbled, squatting next to the woman. You weren't hurt? Nicholas has three gunshot wounds, Tessa whispered. One in the shoulder, two in the stomach. He'll pull through, trust me. After all, he's Fadi's son, Andres said confidently. You knew he was his father? I overheard a conversation with Ilian once. Partisan, Schweitzer smirked, throwing her head back and gazing at the ceiling. I hope you're right, and he pulls through. He's too good to die. Just then, someone walked into the corridor, someone many hadn't seen in over 15 years. The man himself, Fadi. The one who used to instill fear and terror in everyone who knew or saw him. A man with a cane moved confidently, followed by three huge thugs whose fists were three times larger than the head of one of the prison. Who is Tessa? A gruff voice echoed through the bright corridor, and the woman immediately jumped to her feet. My son said you know who did this, Fadi said as he approached the distraught blonde. Schwetz, Tessa replied confidently, it was that damn Schwetz. The man smirked and immediately whispered something to the people behind him. In a second, they were already heading out to take action. Fadi gently took Tessa by the forearm and pulled her along. They ended up in some empty room. My name is Roman, the man began, and I am Nicholas's father. I'm Tessa, the future ex-wife of Schwetz, the woman concluded, constantly fidgeting with her dress with her nervously sweaty fingers. I know all about you, girl. And I know how my son has suffered for you all these years, Roman said. Don't be frightened by what I'm going to tell you. 
My son gave me certain instructions. After his possible death, I must take you to the capital and give you everything that belongs to Nicholas. It's his wish. Tessa turned pale and clutched the couch she was sitting on. Her throat went dry and a noise filled her ears. She didn't want to hear anything related to Nicholas's death. Her head spun and she swayed back sharply. She couldn't bear the thought that, having found true love, she would lose it because of Ilian. Girl, he isn't dead yet, but if it happens, you will come with me, Roman continued, and Tessa couldn't hold back any longer. Tears streamed down her face, soaking her dress. She began to scream, releasing the emotions that had built up over the last two hours of the operation. He won't die, she shouted fiercely when she had no strength left for tears. Roman nodded approvingly. Hang in there, girl. He's strong, Fadi assured the woman and left the room. Three hours after Fadi's arrival, the doctors finally came out of the operating rooms and two of them removed their caps. This could only mean one thing. Who is the wife of Lises? the doctor asked, holding his cap. Luna turned pale and slowly got up from the bench. I'm sorry. Gunshot wound to the heart. Luna immediately fainted and Tessa trembled even more. She was afraid. Afraid of losing the one she had just found. Wife of Garcia, another doctor asked. Anna stood up, wiping tears from her face. Your husband is in a coma. His condition is serious, a ruptured lung, and fractures of two ribs from the fall. Now Tessa was shaking even harder. Either Nicholas had died, or Marta's husband, who carried his child in her womb. Pain pierced every part of her body when Nicholas's name was mentioned. Tessa, on unsteady legs, approached the doctor and didn't even notice his cap. Your husband's condition is stable now, but he will need to stay in the hospital for a few more weeks. Once he wakes up, you'll be able to see him, the doctor said, and a weight lifted off the woman's soul. She cried tears of joy and threw her arms around Roman, who stood behind her. I told you, girl. He pulled through, the man declared, stroking the blonde's back. You give him a reason to live. Unfortunately, Veris Gustavo didn't survive. Three bullets tore through his stomach, and one grazed the valve of his heart, another surgeon concluded, and Tessa swallowed hard. Marta wouldn't survive this. Another anguished scream pierced the air. Marta clawed at her friend's skin on her forearms, gripping them during her hysteria. The tears seemed unending. She screamed so loudly that she tore her vocal cords. Even while gasping, she continued to wail until they injected her with a sedative again. He won't see his father, Marta whispered, running her hand over her belly. He won't know him. Tessa cried quietly, holding her friend's hand, realizing that all of this was Schwetz's fault. The fault of the man she had called her husband for 20 years. Leaving her sleeping friend alone, she made her way to Nicholas's room, where, according to the doctor, he had already come to. Her dress no longer resembled a festive outfit. Her hair was tangled, and her mascara smeared across her face from all the tears. Her eyes were swollen, and her hands still trembled. Entering the room quietly, she found the TV on with the news and him. Weak, bandaged, but still holding his head up confidently. Tessa, Doro said, and the woman immediately rushed to his bedside. She carefully kissed the man's face, avoiding the four drip and his wounds. Easy, easy, Nicholas whispered, smiling. Alive, Tessa mumbled between kisses. Alive, my dear. Look, Doro said pointing his chin at the TV screen. Tessa immediately turned up the volume on the remote lying on the nightstand and focused her gaze on the television. Today, at 5 a.m., well-known businessman in the legal field, Schweitzer Ilian, was killed, the journalist announced. According to unofficial reports, he was murdered during the night with his mistress by an unknown assassin. The other circumstances surrounding the murder remain unknown. Dad? Tessa asked, looking at Nicholas. Exactly, the man smirked and leaned in to kiss his beloved. We managed without a trial. We managed, you're right, Nicholas said, and he kissed his woman nonetheless. 
After so many years of an unsuccessful marriage, many might not have wanted to get married again. But Tessa didn't feel that way. After a year of Nicholas's recovery from the hospital and the birth of Marta's son, they decided to throw a lavish banquet in honor of their wedding. Marta inherited everything her husband owned in life, and she also had Andres to help her, who was thrilled to become a nanny for little Gustavo and a protector for fragile Marta. Perhaps this was another chance for Marta to find a family, even after the loss of her beloved man. Tessa and Nicholas were immensely happy to find true happiness and love in each other. After Schweitzer's death, all his inheritance also went to Tessa because, at that moment, they were still married. Having rid herself of all the illegal dealings, she became the first woman in the elite to own a business and conduct affairs. Of course, not without the help of her newly minted husband. Everything happened as it did. And here the saying, better late than never, comes to mind. If you're enjoying it as well, leave a like and subscribe to the channel.